here. We're going to do just like a little mini lecture today. We're going to go over ceramics 101. Um, it's not, it's going to be kind of short and sweet, uh, but I'm only going to give you the really specific nitty gritty vocab that you absolutely need to know to move forward through the rest of the semester. Um, I want you to put this in your sketchbook or some kind of notebook. You can do it on a single piece of paper, but you've got to make sure that you know where it is. And the reason why this is so important, you know where it is, is because you're going to be able to use this information on your final exam. Why do I do that? Because that's the ceramic world. You always have a resource. You're either going to have colleagues, or you're going to have your sketchbooks filled with notes and information from previous builds that you've done. You're going to have the internet. You're going to have tons of books. So you're always going to be able to find that information if you get stuck. So I just feel like it's appropriate to allow you to be able to do that on your final exam. Now here's the catch. I write the exam. So any information that I give you is probably going to be the answers. So I really encourage you to take advantage of this, put it in your notebook, make sure it's somewhere safe, that way you have it at the end of the semester. This is going to be pretty short, we're just going to go over some really basic vocab and some things that you need to know for the next assignment. And then we'll do another little mini lecture in the next couple weeks. So stay with me and let's get started. Alright guys, welcome. So we're going to go over some really basic vocab and you should be putting this in your notebook. So I have my sketchbook here, and again, if whatever notes you keep in your sketchbook, you can absolutely use it on your final exam. So we're going to go over some really basic vocab. Um, the first thing I did want you to do is go ahead and um, watch that How It's Made video. And the reason I wanted you to do that is because, um, this is kind of weird because you can't see my face, but it's talking about the whole industry before the clay even gets to us and kind of the jobs that could possibly happen and i just wanted you to kind of see that so even though we're talking about fine art and ceramics and kind of um, the building process there is a whole industry that's kind of this industrial side of our work right so the guys that are digging up the clay and taking it to the factory the guys that are kind of going through the process of mixing it all up and then there's the scientists and the chemists that are figuring out what type of clay is going to occur depending on where the, the, the soil is coming from. So they're testing it and figuring out what minerals and elements are in it to define what best will suit that type of clay work, right? So uh, if you're building a porcelain toilet, you're not going to probably use earthenware because it just won't work and that toilet would fall apart. So think about your house. You've got porcelain in your bathroom, countertops, dishes, uh, which dishes kind of falls in fine art, but um, you've got maybe some figurines, sculptural work, you've got uh, planters with pots outside with flowers in, um, in them, so that's for outside. Um, you've got your tiled floor, your backsplashes, so those are all things that are kind of like the more industrial part of the artwork, art field or ceramic world, where we're focusing on fine art. So let's go ahead and get started. So don't write anything down unless they tell you to. Um, which basically, I'm not going to write anything unless I want you to know it. So earthenware is the type of clay that we use in class. The type of clay we use in class, right? So it's the name of the clay. So the name of the clay. Okay. Um, why do we use earthenware? Because it's really durable for a beginner. Yes, you need to write this in your book. Um, don't write what I'm talking about, just what I put on my paper. Um, earthenware is um, really durable. It's good for all types of processes. It's good for hand building. It's good for the pottery wheel. It's good for sculpting. It keeps its moisture and it doesn't crack very much. So it's a really great clay for beginners. Why do else, what's the other reason why we use it? Because it is flexible. So it's flexible. And flexible is really not the vocab word that we want, but flexible equals plasticity. And that's the word that ceramic artists use. So it's high in plasticity because earthenware has a little bit of plastic in it, which makes it really flexible. So this is going to be, this word right here is going to be the important vocab word but it equals flexible. For whatever reason, ceramic artists decided they needed their very own word. 
So next we're gonna get into the stages of dryness. So the stages of dryness are important for many reasons. And you guys kind of went through them with your mug and we're gonna go through them again when you guys build your coil pots. So go ahead and write down stages of dryness. Stages of dryness are gonna be moist clay. And leave a little space because we're gonna come back and we're gonna redefine these. Stiff clay. Leather hard. and bone dry. I'm gonna show you some examples of these. So what do we know after looking at them? We know that moist clay is right out of the bag. It's right when I give it to you, it's really soft, it's really malleable. Stiff clay, it can hold its shape. and you can make attachments. The leather hard stage is when you can do carvings, but cannot change shape. If you try to change the shape at this stage, you will crack it and it will break. And then we have our bone dry clay. Our bone dry clay is also known as greenware. If your clay is at the bone dry stage, then I, Miss Roosh, don't put I because that means you, Miss Roosh has project. If I don't have your project at the greenware stage, then you miss the due date, okay? That's plain and simple. And I already showed you what greenware looks like, so it's really, really brittle. And if you're keeping it, it's really fragile, and you're risking your project being broken. So the, the drop-off date has already come and gone, which we know, and you've kind of missed the firing process. So while we're still on this page, let's go ahead and define what greenware is, because it is that vocab word. It's bone dry clay, which we know. And it's ready to be fired for the first time. So you need to know bone dry clay, ready to be fired for the first time when it comes to greenware. So at this point, we can kind of see that we've got a lot of wear words happening. So we've got earthenware, which is the type of clay, and we have greenware, which is when it's ready to be fired for the first time. Then we go on to bisqueware. So you can see we've got a lot of wear words in the ceramic world. And bisqueware, I'm gonna go ahead and tell you what it is, and then I'll show you an example, is clay that has been fired once. Okay, so clay should be fired once and it's ready to glaze. Unfortunately, if you are participating in the online ceramic class, you will not be glazing your projects this semester. However, if you take me in the future, you can absolutely bring these projects back and feel, feel free to glaze them. Um, but unfortunately, it's just not an option because there would be constant drop-off pickup and um, it would kind of defeat the purpose of having your class online. The other thing that Bisqueware will not do is it will not, will not hold liquid. Now, if you are at home and you want to put color on your Bisqueware because you will get your Bisqueware back, you can use an acrylic paint. But on your mug, if you're gonna use an acrylic paint, you cannot drink out of it. So at that point, it becomes more of a sculptural piece, and that's okay, maybe you could store like pens and pencils in it, or bobby pens, or I have a bunch in my garage that I use to put like screws and bolts in. So we're gonna kind of switch gears, and we're gonna talk about how many times clay shrinks. So clay shrinks two times two times when, while drying, 
and while firing. So two times, one's while drying and one's firing. So what's happening? The water, so the H2O, is evaporating, evaporating. I cannot spell, guys, I think that's wrong. But it's evaporating. Um, once while drying and once while firing. When it goes into the kiln, the kiln gets rid of re the rest of the water, okay? So you need to know that clay shrinks twice, once while drying, once while firing. And it shrinks, let's go ahead and put this, shrinks a half inch. So about a half inch. It's going to depend on the clay, but for earthenware, it's going to shrink about a half inch. Or 10 to 15 percent. So it kind of depends on what kind of measurement you want to use. All right, so now we're going to talk about a little bit about the building process. Now, you guys already are familiar with this word because I talked about it whenever you guys made your mugs. But scoring is done whenever you join two pieces of clay together. And remember, it's like these little hash marks like this, and you go in a bunch of different directions on the clay, so it's creating that really rough texture. But you do it every time. Two pieces of clay are joined. Two pieces of clay are joined every, every, every single time, every time. If you don't score your clay, then your project is going to fall apart. So when we make our coil pots, which is our next assignment, you're going to always uh, score your two coils together. And that will be in more detail in your um, instructional videos when we get to the building. And then, of course, we know this word as well. So slip, because you guys already made some. And all you need to write is H2O plus clay. That's the recipe, H2O plus clay. So this is water, remember. And what is slip? Slip is the glue of the ceramic world. So glue of the ceramic world, right? So the ceramic world, let's draw a little world if you want to. Um, but it's basically, you, whenever these scoring and slipping go hand in hand. Now, which order should you do it in? It doesn't really matter, but I usually always slip and then score. That's the way that I do it. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. So we're almost done, so hang in there with me just for a little bit longer. We've got this fantastic word called wedging. And I'll show you how to do this, but we're going to do a lot of hand wedging. You can do, there's several different ways to wedge. You can do table wedging, but we're going to focus on hand wedging because we're only using a small amount of clay. Now, when do you wedge? You wedge every time, every single time, every time you work with clay. Why? Because, and I'm not talking about your project, I'm talking about the small pieces that you're going to attach to your clay. Why? Because we want to eliminate air bubbles. Air bubbles. And I'm going to show you an example of this. The other thing that wedging does is it increases plasticity. And remember, plasticity equals what? Flexibility. So the more that you wedge, the more flexible your clay will become. And that'll end our notes for today, guys. Okay, so remember I told you I was going to talk to you about the different stages. So here they are. So here is an example of really wet clay. So this is that moist clay. It's really squishy. Um, we can bend it. We can do whatever it is we want to do with it because it has a lot of moisture in it. Once it moves into the next stage, which is a stiff clay stage, you can't do this. If you try to do that, you're going to crack and break it. Um, there's, because within each stage, stage, there are additional stages, but we're not going to get into that. So you've got a little bit of wiggle room when you get into the next stage, which is stiff. Um, but that's where you're going to do your attachments. And I don't have any examples of that because, um, well, we've already turned in our projects, so <laughs> that's kind of why. 
Then we move into, sorry, I got the wrong one here. We're going to move into the leather hard stage, which is this one. So this is an example of leather hard. And the reason I know this is leather hard is, and you, I will go into much more detail whenever we do this with your coil pot, but basically it's pretty stiff. So I can't really bend it. If I try to, it's definitely going to break. The other thing you can test out to see if it's leather hard is you can take a pencil or you can take your fingertip and you can just kind of scrape the clay. And if the crumbs come off really easily or they just fall off, then you know you're at the leather hard stage. If the crumbs stick whenever you do that, then you know that you're still in the stiff clay stage and you haven't transferred into leather hard. And then our last stage, which we know that is bone dry or the greenware stage, and if your project is at this stage, I should have it, right? We've, we've gone through that drop-off process and I have your project here at school. If you have your project, you missed the deadline. You missed your due date and you're probably out of luck unless you've contacted me. Remember, I'm pretty flexible, but you've got to communicate. Why is it so important that this project at the greenware stage is with me? Because it's super, super fragile. Watch this. I'm barely going to touch this and it's going to break, right? So bone dry, your project is at risk of breaking. It's with me for a reason. The other reason I already have this is because I'm going to cook it in the kiln. It's ready to be fired. It doesn't have any water in it anymore. Let's look at the color. So we've got a really dry piece right here. You can see that it's lighter in color. And then we've got a really moist piece that's got a lot of water. So what's happening? Remember, the water is leaving, which is why the color is changing. Here is an example of a project that was not wedged properly and had air pockets. So when you don't wedge your clay, air pockets develop. And this guy used to have a face, but he had a little air pocket in there and it exploded. He also used to have a little shoulder. So what's an air pocket? An air pocket is exactly what it seems. It's like this little tiny air bubble. It could be as big as the tip of this pencil. And what happens is, if you can imagine that my hands are an air bubble, the water that's in the clay is still remaining in there. It's going to turn to steam. It's going to start boiling. So water turns to steam at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you can imagine my hands are an air pocket. It's boiling, boiling, boiling. It's getting bigger. It's start, the pressure's building. It's turned to steam. The steam has nowhere to go. And bam, it explodes. And that little man over there, that's the result. So it can be really devastating. So it's really important to wedge your clay. I hope that you guys kind of enjoyed this a little bit. I know notes are never really fun, but make sure that you put these in your sketchbook so you can use them on your final. This is really going to help you as we continue down the road of building. So our next step is going to be able to prep our clay and get started on our coil pot. So stay tuned guys and I'll see you next time.